At long last, October 30th marked the release of one of the biggest game-changing sets, VBT-10 Phantom Dragons Aeon. Now normally I would have done a box opening, but unfortunately we ordered, my locals ordered the boxes a bit too late, and I think the supplier just couldn't, the distributor couldn't just ship them out on time, so that might randomly be uploaded at some point. Late, might not, depends if we even get them at this point. If not, then I guess we'll wait until the end of November for VBT-11. But today I want to talk about a little bit uh, about this unique situation that we have with not just the VBT-10 release, but also with the Luart restriction. So as you know, or may not know, um, when VBT-10 released in Japan, it was without any restriction list. It was, you know, you could use the main in the Luart deck, no problem. But with the release of the English release, so October 30th, the Luart in the main choice restriction was already in place. So the Luart list that you'll be seeing in the English format come October 30th, will all be essentially just changed up and will not be using the Nimane engine. Instead, they'll be using what you see modern Japanese lists use. And, you know, funny that I mentioned that because Luard post-restriction hasn't really slowed down whatsoever. If anything, it's been doing greater than ever. Or I don't know if it's greater than before, but let's just say VMC finals uh, for the spring split. And so the reason why the spring circuit ended, you know, in October is because of, of course, COVID. So everything got delayed. And once the situation got more stable in Japan, they allowed for the events to finish. So the finals took place in October. And what do you know? Top four split was all Luard. Now, there were some interesting things with this event. It was a 36 person invitational because it was a qualifier based tournament. So you had to win the qualifiers for the VMC to actually make it to the finals. So, you know, it was just 36 slots, all of them were occupied, and that makes sense. And there was plenty of diversity in the decks that people were bringing. One of the Japanese channels, Gamers Dogma, actually did interviews with all the players participating. I think all of them, or at least most of them. And, you know, there was quite a bit of variety. It wasn't just all Luard, you know, there was quite a lot of Shirani running around. I think there was still some Night Rose, I can't remember. There was even a Blau. So there was plenty of things that were running around, you know, in that 36 player invitational. But the interesting thing was is that it was 36 players, it was 6 rounds of Swiss, but the top cut was top 4 rather than top 8, which is a little bit strange. But that aside, the results were all of top 4, 1st to 4th, were all Luard. So why do we speak of this tournament results? Of course, you know, this top 4 is very important because not only is it all Luard top 4, it's also basically 4 different Luard lists, all kind of focusing on different things, you have lists that focus more on retiring, lists that focus more on defense and like intercept generation and all that kind of stuff and you know it really feels like Luard as a deck is a jack of all trades and of course it does have counters, it does have decks that it's weaker to but it still feels like it's like up and away better than the rest and you know now it's that it's out in English we have to be more aware of it. I've already made a video of like how Luard is adapting so you can check that out if you haven't already but it really feels like Luard needs to just like either get slapped on the wrist again you know and this time a heavier slap than just the main and you know hopefully not as much of a economy bursting one but it also feels like Bushrod needs to come to a decision of whether they slap it or whether they just like print more busted promos or busted support for everything to pull it up to the same power level which it definitely should not because Luard's power level is already insane like it is really a deck that can do everything and that is pretty damn crazy but Luckily, very lucky to us, we have a very important person in our community, which is Dexander. So Dexander, he has a really cool, nice little, uh, his blog has a nice new logo with Isabel on it. So Isabel, not Isabel, Dexander has a uh, post of the basically VBT10 meta, and he made a separate spreadsheet or table pie chart with the post restriction list one. And so I want to take a look at it today as sort of a meta analysis. So it's going to be kind of a VBT10 meta analysis. We haven't really done one yet, but at the same time, it's also going to be very much just like looking at what the post restriction list meta looks like and whether Luard is still towering over everything. From what I've said so far, it does sound like it. So does it? There you go. It is 30%. Now, 30%, I mean, this looks basically like Revere did in January, I would say, or I don't know what else, Melody last year, kind of as well. I would say, like, Mordred, Huga, Lukier kind of had similar showings as well. And we've definitely had this, like, 
big old representation before so it's definitely not too surprising but you know we've talked a lot about Luard I've, I've made a lot of videos about Luard in general we all know it's an incredible deck uh, WCC also made a cool little comprehensive deck guide uh, just today actually you can go give that a look if you want to but I want to take a look a little bit at the other things on this list too so Luard you know basically spent the entirety of this video so far talking about it but what else came up out of this set that suddenly feels like it's so capable so in second we have almost 10% gear chronicle next stage so this is a list that definitely feels like it's been pushed by its promos so the promo that essentially you know adds another chrono tooth tigar to the list is you know just amazing for next stage like the deck itself feels also kind of similar as a jack of all trades you know it has a little bit a little bit of field control has quite a lot of plusing has restanding vanguard quote unquote, you know, with next stage, and it just has a lot of advantage going for itself. So it feels like, you know, it, it makes sense for it to be a very good deck. And especially with the new promo, it feels like it's really, really good. And it's interesting because we saw that like next stage and, you know, Chronojet could still top even when Luard was without the restriction list. And it looks like that has just continued so far. And we've definitely seen these next stage lists pop up here and there. And I think it's quite nice that, you know, we have, what, 37 uh, Luard lists in this pie chart, and the 12 of them, uh, you know, 12 of the of the pie chart are next stage. So it's nice that, like, it does take up a pretty big chunk of it as well. It's nowhere near as much as Luard, you know, it's just a third of it, but it's still pretty good. And I think that it's nice to see that, you know, Luard isn't the only force deck that's, like, towering over everything. Because when we look down, Night Rose. Night Rose is a deck that definitely feels like it was kind of sleeping it wasn't really doing much in the pie charts and the tournament and the top eight cuts and everything until recently uh, until ever since the post restriction almost it feels like but also i would like to point out that in japan not that many deck lists were running navigator for quite some time and it feels like as soon as it became more popular to run navigator in japan that's when we saw night rose come up and up and up again and it just came just kept showing up and it just kept popping up and i think that was really indicative of just how strong navigator is as a card and i think that that is part of why night rose can go up to like a 7.5 percent so nine entire tops of this pie chart being night rose and also being a protect deck immediately kind of gives it a slight slight edge against these force matchups you know obviously it's not as amazing as insane you know the deck is still it's not fragile by any, by any means it can plus like crazy it's super versatile it can basically do whatever you command it to do but it still you know has to have a particular game plan that adapts to where the opponent is at in terms of their hand in terms of their damage in terms of the situation of the game and so it can't just like steamroll the opponent as easily i would say you could argue like oh four skull dragon attacks are steamrolling but even that you know if your opponent's at three that's nowhere near as disgustingly strong as if they're at five so it's like the ability to just I mean, I feel like maybe this point doesn't make as much sense, but I feel like Luar doesn't struggle to push the opponent to that point as much by doing much less. But at the same time, an important thing is that Night Rose and I would say Next Stage by an extent too, are not as much prone to being denied of their plays as Luar. You know, Luar, I think the most famous thing we see in tournaments is Luar's damage denying each other like just not giving themselves that one candle blast to be able to do the drag driver and just like you know not being able to push out that insane plus and instead they just kind of freeze make a few force markers and stop there uh, then we have yasuya yasuya is another really really strong potential deck you know being able to do basically the most multi taxi manageable you basically double shirayuki in one turn all these kind of fancy plays like i've played against the deck a fair bit myself because my teammate uses it and yasuya definitely is really really capable um going first especially it feels like it can burst down almost anything and that is really strong is it healthy i don't know are any of these decks healthy I don't know. I think they are and are not at the same time, but that's not what this video is trying to discuss. I'm just trying to give you a good impression of what this meta is and what we're standing at right now. So then we have Kagero with the cross. This is all the cross lists, all eight of them. Um, pretty interesting. You know, the cross, I don't know which lineups these lists run. A lot of the community seem to agree that 16 crit is like the way for the cross because you just like jam crits, use the cross, restand, restand, crit them to death and win the game like that. And if feels like you know maybe that did come up to a certain extent then Gridora. Gridora is a list that definitely has been discussed a lot because Gridora, a lot of people were like well if Luard just you know poops out a board every turn that's just full of attackers full of everything you just like pile it up with Gridora's little you know markers or whatever they are and just make 
you know, if they're gonna plus, then so are you, you know, that kind of thing. So, Gridora definitely felt like it's been able to not just punish Luard, but, you know, think of Yasuya as well. Yasuya pushes out an entire board, and it's able to just, like, you know, flood it easily, but at the same time, if you're getting resources just as fast as them, then it's pretty good too. And, you know, it's, it's quite nice for that reason, and I think that, like, Gridora does have this kind of position as a sort of counter deck to a lot of the popular sort of field spam decks. I think Night Rose is the one deck that can kind of get around it, because Night always retires all your stuff so they can't really flood your board with anything so they have to like change up their game plan entirely so you know Gridora does feel like it's quite potent. Sharrod has dropped a lot that's for sure like Sharrod has been genuinely like seen as one of the best decks and now with Luar running around it's still seen as one of the best decks but statistically not topping as much does that have to do with popularity I'm not sure we've already talked about it a lot in the previous meta analysis so I don't want to spend too much time but Still pretty cool. And then now we start seeing a lot of the other like repeating faces. So Messiah, as MLB, Alt Mile, Mordred, Blade Master, Blood Black Gallop, uh, Luke here coming up, Bang Dream, and a bunch of others. But the only ones that are new here, we have Spikes. Spikes are interesting because I think to build a full competitive deck in, in, in Japanese, you probably spend like 20 bucks tops. Something like that. Something insane. Like it's so cheap, it's actually ridiculous. But at the same time, this is an insanely good deck. Being able to get both forces all the time is amazing. You have multi attacks, you have so much power going for you, you have like this the force passing around and all that stuff. It's actually quite ridiculous. You know, I've only seen like a few games of uh, Rising Nova being played, and it's honestly quite insane how much the deck can do. And considering how cheap it is, too, it feels like, man, if we had the BCS circuit in English right now, we would be seeing it come up quite a lot. And it feels like that would also push the market price a little bit, too. But Rising Nova definitely feels like it's only not topping as much because spikes aren't popular but the deck is definitely super strong and feels like it feels like it's still being slept on even though everybody says it's really strong but trust me you watch a couple good games and you're like damn so that's what this deck can do so yeah then uh the other newcomers from this set were pbo so pure pbo sadly doesn't come up as much it doesn't do as much as luard it's still pretty strong because it's the now the only deck that can well not the only deck but it's the deck that can use the phantom blaster right up you know, build quite well with the main and everything. You know, obviously Mordred can use that too, and we see Mordred in here as well. Uh, sadly, one less top than the PBO, but I mean, still, Mordred was always good, and you know, that doesn't stop it from topping now either. And so sadly, the only kind of missing factor in this is just Tachikaze from this set, so Tachis didn't really get the treatment they deserved from this set, but still, I mean, it's... You know, it's definitely towered over and dominated by Luard, but you know, I've talked a lot about the VMC result that we had. So VMC, you know, top four Luards. But I think in the same weekend or the weekend after that, there was a WGP qualifier where I think the top four either had just one Luard or no Luards, something like that. And, you know, this it was just like, I think it was something along the lines of like Shiranoi. I think it was also Chronojet. I want to say Lambros as well and things like that. I can't remember exactly. Again, check out WCC because they cover all these events, you know, as soon as the results finish. So it's a good place to check like a summary of all these results. Even DP has been getting tops and there's actually a really interesting uh, Miracle Beauty variant which has been dominating Luard apparently. So that is really interesting. So I'm gonna kind of like my takeaway for this video I think is that even though Luard is like towering over the meta and just like dominating everything It feels like players are trying to like go out of their way to find ways to Counter Luard and conquer the matchup and just find builds that it, that are just like okay If I'm gonna sit in a tournament and all five rounds I'm gonna be facing Luard I'm gonna make the deck that can beat up Luard as best as possible and that's where lists like the Miracle Beauty Brad Black build come out of because that's exactly what that can do. Pop, pop, put down some Miracle Beauties, put up some Die Arms, and just swing for a bunch of power multiple times, and there you go, the game's finished. So, it really is interesting. We're gonna see how this continues into VBT11 with the release of quite a lot of decks. You know, Isabel is generating a lot of hype. You know, Big Belly and Premium is looking really good. On top of that, you know, Thavas and Victor are also looking like strong rush decks, especially Thavas. And, you know, Shironoi, I've mentioned it a lot, Shironoi looks to be also one of those big top contender decks as well and you know kind of rounding out the protect decks that are in this meta to look like it's quite evenly split now it feels like after vbt11 we're gonna have a pretty interesting split of force axel protect decks taking up the meta slots but yeah so 
that's what the meta looks like right now. The next set release is just around the corner, so I didn't want to wait too long to make this video. So in just a few weeks, we're going to be back and talk about VBT11 and how that looked in Japan. Of course, VBT12 is releasing in Japan in this week that I'm uploading this. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see where things go. So I think it's literally releasing tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to see if uh, Gavriel and others will be able to make a splash or not. But on that note, that's going to be it for me today. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.